Oh, hold on one second. There we go. All right, let's try this again. Guys, welcome to another episode of Edge Master Gaming. And as you can tell from the title, we are covering the newest game to the channel, Those Who Remain. I've been playing this game for a little while now, so I know enough to be decent at the game, but not quite good enough to be a pro. My hope is to change that in the near future while bringing you guys along for the journey. But as always, before we get started, if there's anything that you find helpful in this video at all, please hit the like and subscribe buttons below. Also, if you're interested in joining my Discord, you'll find the link in the description box along with other information about those who remain. All right, guys, let's get started. To begin, let's cover everything that you should see once you enter the main lobby of the game. First off, any time that you enter a game that rewards you for daily logins, you know that you're going to have to put in some work. That's just a given. As you see here, the cash rewards range from $1,000 all the way to $7,000 depending on your daily login, which brings your grand total of $28,000 earned for that week. Now if you miss a day, then your logins get reset and you'll go back to day one. Also, if you fulfill your weekly login quota, you'll also reset going back to day one. I hope that makes sense. And I'm not familiar with the extra 50% login rewards. From the looks of it, it looks like you have to join a group in order to unlock this, but I'll definitely be checking into that at some other time. Moving on, we enter what looks like a cabin in a room by a fireplace. It's also decorated for the holidays, which is a nice touch. You'll notice player names that have already joined the server, like yourself, in the upper right hand corner. There are only eight players max that can join. Each player has either the words not ready or ready on the left side, a small game controller icon on the right side, followed by a number. So what do these things mean? Anyone that just enters the server is always in the not ready state. It simply means that the player is not ready to play the game. Whereas the ready state means that the player is ready to join on the next wave if they are not already playing the game. Whenever you're ready to begin, click the word ready. If you change your mind or need to take a break, click the word unready. It's as simple as that. Next, the small control icon, if you notice, are only on a select few of the players here. What this means is that these players are playing the game on Xbox. Lastly, the numbers on the end here covers that player's experience level. As you can see, I'm at level 40. Moving over a bit to the center of the screen, at the top you'll see three key pieces of information. The wave number, a clock, and a map name. So as it reads, the players are currently on the district map on wave 9 with 7 seconds left to play. Currently there are 9 maps total. Each map requires you to survive 15 waves in order to successfully win against the horde. And each wave lasts a total of 5 minutes. Once a wave is complete, there's a 20 second intermission with a 5 second starting phase followed by a 10 second transition phase. Simply put, if you don't ready up by the time the starting phase is over, you'll have to wait till the next wave is done before you can enter the game. Next we have Loadout. When you click on it, it brings you to a garage area and gives you a list of primary, secondary, and melee weapons. Each weapon listed has a number in front and a price for the weapon listed on the end. This number represents the experience level required in order to purchase the weapon at this price. For example, this Ingram MAC-10 requires me to be at or above a level 8 in order to purchase this weapon for $6,200. When you click on it, it kindly asks what I'd like to purchase it. Okay, now let's pick a weapon where I don't meet the required experience. Because I'm a level 40, let's choose the CMMG. As you see, you have to be a level 48 in order for it to be purchased at $102,500. So when you click on it, it lets you know that you don't have the experience. However, you do have the option to purchase the gun early for $205,000. As you see, the price lowers as you level up. And this goes for every weapon that you can purchase in this game. The further you are away from the required level, the more expensive that it's going to be to actually purchase it. On the bottom at the center of the screen, we have the leaderboards link, which is located here. When you click on it, you'll be brought to this bulletin board in the back. It shows all of your personal stats, your weekly ranking, highest level players, top players for the weekly leaderboard, which is based on whatever the challenge is for that week, and how much time is left before the challenge ends. Like this week is the most kills challenge, and the person in line to win is this person with 53,700 kills, 
Good grief, that's a lot. And there's still over three days to go according to the timer. This actually looks pretty fun and I may do something like this in the near future. Let's move on to perks. When you click on it, we move to another part of the garage. You'll see a total of 21 to choose from. They are broken down into three separate categories, survivalist, craftsman, and marksman. Survivalist perks only affects your character. Craftsman perks only has an effect on things that you can build. Marksman perks only enhances how you use your weapons. You'll also notice that there's a number at the top of the perks. And you guessed it, this number is for the experience level required to use them. That's why as a level 40, I can only access 9 of these for now. Once I hit 45, these next 3 will be unlocked. Finally, there are only 3 slots available when selecting your perks. The good thing is that you can select any 3 perks that you'd like once you reach the experience level to use them. So you can use one from all 3 categories, or select all 3 from one category. Select whatever variation you wish. Next we're covering the shop. When you click on it, we're brought just outside of what looks like an office or study. Everything associated with the shop is all about Robux. There are three tabs. Credits, power-ups and passes, and skins. You can purchase more in-game currency on the credits tab. The power-ups and passes tab provides extras to help you fight the horde or level up faster. Like this experience boost times two. Or like this one that gives you an extra perk slot in the perks menu. And last, we have different skins for your weapons. As you see, there's a tier one, two, three, and a neon chest. When you click on one and purchase it, it randomly selects and unlocks a skin like you see here. After the skin is chosen, you'll need to go back to the loadout screen and select the weapon that you want to apply the skin color to, like this. Now, I will say that anything that's associated with the shop, you should probably put on hold until you get all the weapons that you want. As mentioned before, this game is about the grind, and if you're going to spend this type of cash on skins, then you're probably going to be here for a while. Next, we have spectating. When you click on it, you will immediately begin viewing a player while a game is in progress. While you're spectating, you can cycle through all of the current players in the game by either pressing the Q and E keys on the keyboard, or by using the mouse to do it on the screen, like you see here. If you use the wheel on the mouse, it will control the zoom feature. If you hold down the right mouse button, you can pivot around the player that you're focused on to see different angles of the action. Next, we have the last item in the lobby, the options menu. When you click on it, we're brought to the kitchen area and the options are broken into three sections, player, graphics, and audio. The player section allows you to view all the different settings that affects your character in game, like aim sensitivity and what buttons are assigned to certain actions like your primary and secondary weapons. A few of these you can adjust and a few you can. The graphics section allows you to enable and disable particular actions in the game. If you're noticing any latency or slowdowns when a particular action occurs, you may want to disable it here to see if it makes a difference. Finally, we have the audio section that allows you to control the level of different sounds as well as the game music. You can go through those and adjust any and all of them to your liking. Now that we have the lobby out of the way, Let's move on to the different maps in the game. All map information can be found at the wiki link, which will be in the description box below. There are currently nine different maps that are randomly chosen when playing those who remain. Our first map is Bypass. Located in Chapel County, the map is centered around a long road heading into the city. A small strip mall and gas station is located alongside the road between a bridge at one end of the map, leading to a tunnel, and a highway overpass at the other end of the map. Next map is Cabin. 
This map takes place at a cabin in the middle of a forest during the night, so visibility is very poor for struggling survivors. Whatever you do, do not stray far away from the cabin or you may lose your way back, putting you in a very tight situation. The next map is Cargo. This map takes place in a shipyard along a body of water. You'll have to make your way in and around many shipping containers, avoiding the infected in the process if you want to survive. Now we have District. This map takes place in a town in what appears to be an overrun survivor settlement with walls blocking off streets to keep a safe zone. Our next map is Expressway. It's a map that's centered around an enormous bridge. There are block fences on one side of the bridge and an infected spawner area on the other side with an invisible wall. The map is packed with many items and cars. Next we have Manor. This map is set in France which is centered around an estate or church. It is very open and can provide a lot of supplies for survivors looking to roam inside of the Manor's corridors. Since Manor is a very open map, it is very easy to get lost inside. Our next map is Mill. It's located in Canada, probably British Columbia, with a large logging camp located in the middle. Freezing temperatures and snow have frozen the nearby lake, permitting infected to walk across uninhibited. Our next map is Prison. It is located within a clearing somewhere in the U.S. surrounded by trees. Wire fences are used to block entry and exits to the areas in and around the prison. However, the infected were able to tear down several sections of fence before players arrived, allowing both to wander around freely. Evidence points to this map being located somewhere in Iowa. Our last and final map is Ranch. It takes place in Texas with a house, a barn, and a storehouse and stable side by side. Various empty fields make up a lot of the map between the buildings and are separated by wooden fences. Ranch is often debated as being one of the easiest maps currently in game due to its large open plan nature, making it an excellent map for free running. Now we're gonna cover the controls and on-screen indicators while you're in game. The bottom right hand corner shows many indicators associated with your character. The outer part of the ring here shows four bars which will turn blue when you are wearing body armor. When you are attacked, the body armor will begin to wear down as it absorbs most of the impact, like you see here. Next, the inner green ring that has five bars is your health. You want to make sure that you're in the green at all times. Once you get low on health, the bar will turn red, your heart will beat faster, and the screen will turn gray. If you don't find health after this point, your next hit will be your last, and I will demonstrate this here. Well, that's refreshing. Why would they have me die with my behind in the air? At least let me die with some dignity, good grief. Moving on, the yellow bar here indicates what experience level you are at and how much is required for you to level up. Moving towards the inner circle, at the top it shows what weapon you currently have equipped. Now you can cycle through your primary, secondary, and tertiary weapons by either pressing the one, two, or three keys, or you can use the mouse wheel by scrolling up to achieve the same thing as you see here. The numbers to the left shows how many rounds you have in the magazine and in reserves. This area here is used for throwable items that you may have picked up in the game like molotovs, frags, or nerve gas. The way that you can use these items are by scrolling down on the mouse and it will allow you to select the one that you want to use. Now below that is how much money you currently have in the game. 
And lastly, the controls are very similar to other games when it comes to the WASD keys. Left and right click are to pull the trigger and aim respectively. Aside from that, use E as an echo to pick up items and F for Fox when it comes to building things. When preparing to build, use the mouse wheel to select the item and then use left click to deploy it. The R key as in Romeo is used to reload. You can use spacebar to jump. And the most important key of all is going to be the shift key, which enables you to run. The great thing here is that you never get tired so you can literally run the entire wave if you want it. I guarantee that you and this key will become best friends. Now let's cover objectives. When entering any wave, you may see white symbols on the screen like this one here. These symbols indicate an objective that you can perform that will not only help you gain a lot of experience, but will also help you gain a lot of money as well. That is if you complete them, of course. Currently, there are six different objectives in total, and all of them are optional. The first is the escort objective, as noted with a symbol of someone walking. In this objective, you are to locate an individual who needs to be escorted to certain places on the map safely. Next, we have the repair objective, which has the symbol of a wrench. For this one, you and your team must find parts allocated somewhere across the map to repair a vehicle. Third, we have the packing objective, as you see here with an arrow pointing down into a box. Here you and the team must pack supplies on a bus in order for it to be fully prepared for transport. Fourth, we have the unpacking objective, which carries the symbol of multiple boxes together. In this objective, you have crates or boxes that are already located on the map, and your team must stand in the circle to get the boxes open, ultimately getting the supplies within. Next is the fire objective which has a symbol of an explosion. The point of this objective is to blow up this tanker. When the tanker is blown, the fuel that is spilled actually can be used to set the infected on fire. And last, we have the radio objective, which looks very much like the Spotify symbol. This objective requires you and your teammates to stand in this circle to make a call out on the radio for help to get supplies. When you complete these objectives, your reward will appear in the center of the screen like you see here. One issue that I'd like to note is the green number represents how much money you've earned, while the yellow one is how much experience you've received even though there's a dollar sign in front of it. This is very misleading, I know, but let's move on. When the radio objective is done, a helicopter will arrive somewhere on the map. You should then make your way over there because the supplies that are dropped can be very helpful to your arsenal. Which leads me to my next topic. Now we're going to go ahead and cover all of the items that can be picked up in those who remain. First are the bandages. Anytime that you pick these up, it restores a fifth of the player's health, which is equivalent to a single bar. Next, we have the med kit. This item completely restores the player's health when picked up. Up next, we have frags. These explode a few seconds after being thrown, dealing splash damage to enemies around it.
<laughs> Our fourth item is the Molotov. This item lights the ground on fire for a limited time, roughly from 45 seconds to one minute. It causes damage over time to any infected that enter it, which is enough to kill all but bloaters and riot infected. Our fifth item is Nerve Gas. Similar to the Molotov, but instead of fire, it releases nerve gas into the surrounding area, slowing down nearby infected. Next, we have the ammo box. This item gives the player ammunition. Now up is the energy drink. This temporarily gives the player a speed boost followed by a faded blue effect at the edges of the player's screen. It lasts a total of 30 seconds. Up next is the body armor. It decreases damage taken by the user by 50% with the armor taking the brunt of the attacks. It does not work against bloater spores or burster gas. Moving on to Jack. This is a set of frags that are tied to a Jack in the Box. Once the item is set, it explodes after roughly 10 seconds and it deals very high damage. You can only carry one. <laughs> Next, we have the clap bomb. This is an IED and will only go off when the infected trips it. Our second to last on the list is barbed wire. This slows down and damages all the infected that touch it. It also grants the player who placed the barbed wire down an assist bonus when an infected that touches it is killed by another player. Every time you pick one up, you'll have two in your inventory. And finally, the 50 cal. This is a special fortification obtained from the supply helicopter. It takes three hammer swings to deploy and can be used by any player. It carries 200 bullets, can rotate about 45 degrees, and deals very high damage. Our last category deals with the infected zombies that you may come across. Currently, there are only seven types. Civilian infected zombies are not that big of a threat as they are easy to kill. However, when they begin swarming you with their great numbers in later waves, they can be very problematic. Sprinter infected zombies look just like the civilian infected, but they happen to be a lot faster, especially in the later waves. Military infected zombies are easy to spot because of their uniforms, and they can be a little difficult to kill because of their military grade armor. In the later waves, you can't outrun them without the energy drink or the speed demon perk. Riot infected zombies are really tough. While they walk at a slightly slower pace because of all their gear, their melee attacks are no joke.
Bloater infected zombies, as you can see, have spore clusters on their body. When they attack, they throw the spores at you. While they are slow to move, if they catch you with a close ranged attack, they will deal a significant amount of damage. Bolter infected zombies are always in a crawling posture, looking like that girl from The Grudge. They are very quick and can leap at you. Their attacks aren't very strong, but because they are fast, they can hit you with many swipes if you're not careful. First infected zombies are here, and while they move slow, they must always be killed with a headshot or by burning them. If they die by any other means, they will explode, releasing gas that can harm you and the team while passing through it. Overall, this game is really fun. I really enjoyed playing and gathering the information that I hope will be a blessing to anyone who is looking to get into this game. Guys, I thank you so much for tuning in. As of right now, we're at 738 subscribers and that is huge. I sincerely appreciate all of you guys more than you know. Again, please don't forget to drop a comment letting me know that you stopped by, as well as what you think of this guide. As always guys, remember to have fun, take care, and God bless.